Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is Tony. I'm joined on the show today by Pastor Benjamin Faircloth from Ignited Church in Livonia, Georgia. And he's going to bring a word today that is powerful, somewhat sobering, but also encouraging. Welcome back to the A Minute to Midnight show, Pastor Benjamin Faircloth. It's really good to have you on today's show, Pastor. Thank you, Brother Tony. I'm extremely humbled and honoured to be with you. We had you on a few weeks ago, and it definitely got a lot of people's interest up. In fact, it still is. People are still talking about it. Um, and it, it was quite a, an important word, and I, I believe you have some more rather important words that we all need to hear. And I'd like to start off with discussing one in particular, which was a prophetic word that you shared called, we are in a 60-day window of a national heart attack. Can you give our listeners a bit of a rundown on this prophetic word? Absolutely. I sure appreciate it. Uh, August 28th of of this year, uh, I went away with the father and spent a little bit of time with them. And he spoke these words to me. He said, America, I've weighed you in my balances of righteousness, and you have been found wanting. Your extortion and bribery is a stench that has raised to heaven. He said, I will no longer look the other way. I can no longer weak at your sin. Now is the time for the payment required for your sin. You've abandoned me. You've rejected me. And now your heart has a void, a void no amount of sin can fill. Your watchmen have have warned, but you've turned your head. My prophets have sounded my trumpets of judgment, but you stopped up your hearing with another gospel, a strange sound and fire. Behold, I will strike at the heart of this nation, the center of your pleasures and desires. Your folly will become your shackles. Your feasts will become your famines because you have rejected my counsel. I told you to buy of me pure gold, tried in the fires of righteousness, but you chose fool's gold, riches bathed in vanity. You lusted for the riches of Egypt. You longed for the beauty of Babylon. Here it is. I will give it to you and you will vomit with the spoils of your pursuit. Your beauty, O America, will change. As a bride who's played the whore, your dress will be stained with vileness and all manner of uncleanness. You have chosen this. You have desired this. You have abandoned my pardon. The hour has come. I will strike at your heart. Your riches will fade. Your beauty will be consumed by grief and much sorrow. But Brother Tony, the the beginning of the dialogue or the download, if you will, from the father is he spoke this to me. He said, he said, you're in a, uh, he said, a national heart attack is coming. A national heart attack is coming. And then uh, what I just read to you was was the remainder of that word. And then at the end, as I pondered, I was like, wow, that's a pretty heavy word, Father. You know, heart attacks are very serious. If you have a family member or if you've studied medical, uh, you know, conditions, you understand that when somebody has this this uh, this strike, their life, their body, it's it's life changing. And so at the end of that, uh, questioning of the father, he spoke to me, he said, we are in a 60 day window of a national economic heart attack, prepare accordingly. And, and so what, what I want to say about that, brother Tony, it's, it's not just the economy. I believe there's coming something that is so striking to the heart of this nation. And this will be global. There's no doubt about it, but this was a specific message for America but something is going to bring us to the point where we are going to fall into the shock, into the terror of, of an event that's going to cause us uh, literally to have a heart attack in this country. It's interesting because, you know, like, talking to other members of our Minute to Midnight team, Matt and Chris and Brooke and whatnot, we've all kind of had this feeling that we are on the cusp that, Something big is coming, and it's coming very soon uh, in the economic realm and pr- and probably a lot of other things as well. But there's that, that sort of feeling, and, and so your word really resonated with all of us. Mm-hmm. So it's primarily an economic heart attack that you speak of, and the time is late, but do you have any advice to people on what they should do 
what you believe they should do to prepare while they still have a chance? Well, uh, again, because I believe this is this is a double edged sword. It is going to be financial. It's going to do, deal with the economy, but it's also going to deal with terrorism and natural disasters. So how do you prepare? Well, you know, the first thing you do is you get into the place of faith. That's your greatest refuge. Uh, I believe that faith is not an option. It's a lifestyle. You have to live this thing. You have to live the Bible. It isn't something that is uh, just secondary to you. This is an absolute must uh, of, of a life, if you will. So I think the first thing is, is you get your house in order spiritually. Get your life right with God. You're not promised tomorrow. No man is. So get that right first. If you really love God and you're really passionate about him, then you'll pursue him regardless of the threat of, of the economy falling or terrorism. You just love God. You're full of passion. So that would be the first thing. And once that is taken care of, then the relationship you have with the Father should determine what you need to do with your life. In other words, I don't know your economy in New Zealand. I don't know the economy uh, in another city down the road or a person's personal lifestyle. So this whole preparation is not one size fits all. And we have to recognize that because God will never create a world for you or me where faith is not needed. God will never create a world where faith is not needed. We have to have faith. So what works for me in the realm of faith is going to be different than you, Brother Tony, where you're at, because your relationship is, is different than mine. So uh, that may sound you know, shallow and generic, but it's very, very powerful uh, because once you know what the Holy Spirit wants you to do, then you can start working that thing out yourself. And, you know, yeah, there's things you can do. You can, you know, get your money situated where it's not in a uh, in an institution, a financial institution where you can't touch it and grab it. Uh, you know, those are personal uh, personal preparations that you have to decide. Do you buy gold and silver? That's up to you. You see, and I think what happens is a lot of times, Brother Tony, people are looking to the prophetic community for those specific answers. And I think we've done a good job of telling people over the past several years. But I think what we miss is the element of faith. You must have faith in God. Yeah, I agree. And and it, like you say, it will be different for everyone, which is where it comes into being able to hear from God for ourselves because he's not going to tell every person to do exactly the same thing because the situations are different. But it's so important to have our ears tuned into God as individuals. We can't look to somebody else to tell us what to do. A apart from, you know, there are general things like you just mentioned, right. and um, they're obviously important. But we're still going to need that faith because we can't foresee every circumstance and every situation. And uh, and so only God knows what lies in the road for, for us. And I kind of cringe when I see a lot of the prepper type community, you know, preparing to hunker down and bunker down with loads of weapons and 20 years worth of food and they think they're going to survive. And it's like, oh, my goodness gracious. But no, um, no. anyway, so, yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. That's where I, I'm, I want to get away from. I've given a lot of counsel, a lot of advice over the years. Brother Tony, it's all archived. You can go and I have a survival guide on my website. You know, all that stuff is great, but we need to start getting to the root. We need to start getting to the heart and the core of what's going to take place on this earth and why. God is still developing us. He's still developing the church. We're still being discipled. And none of this, these events, none of these end time revelations, the end time situations, none of this changes the developmental plan of God. He's still working his church through this thing. And so if we'll just get to the core of the matter and the core uh, is our heart. See, God, God is more concerned what's happening in me than what's happening to me. Yeah. Yeah. That is always the uh the maneuvers, if you will, or the methodology of God is to get to my heart. He wants my heart. And so if we'll start applying this into the preparation plans, it, which again, it should be initial, it should be number one. If we'll start getting to the reality that what's happening is for us and what God wants to do with the church, I think we're not going to worry as much as people are worrying right now. 
The funny thing, though, is I have a sense, you know, that I said before, that we're very close to hugely major events unfolding, and yet, by and large, the people are asleep, kind of like lulled into a false sense of security, almost like they don't care. Is this something that you've noticed, or is it just me that's seeing that? No, if you're if you're in this community, and I mean the prophetic community, the revelation community, yeah, you hear it constantly. You see it. Uh, you can you can sense it. Uh, yeah, there's there's just this whole ideal of. If, let me just give you an American mindset. It can't happen here. What do you what do you mean the shelves are going to be empty? What do you mean uh, I'm looking into the mirror when I see Venezuela and, and so on and so forth? It just can't happen to me. And that's that Babylonian pride, that Jezebel spirit that's on our our nation. And unfortunately, it's in our churches today. And, uh, you know, they use as weaponry and ammo what happened last year and say, well, you know, everybody got on their their high horse and they said this is the end. Well, if anybody said it was the end, they were mistaken in the first place. But the point is. People have gone back to sleep, and that has been one of my greatest fears throughout this year, Brother Tony, and I have kept my foot on the pedal. I've mentioned this before. I mean, I'm going all the way through the radiator. That's how far I got my foot on the gas because, uh, you know, these things, listen, judgment delayed is not judgment denied. Yeah, there's a big difference, isn't there? Yes. Big difference. Yeah. And we think because something's been delayed, it's been denied, and then we go off, and it's like the child who who thought he got away with something, you know. And that's that's where we are today. But but I'm telling you, the trap has been set, and it's it's about to snap. On a practical level, I'm, I look recently at what's going on with the, that South Korean shipping country company Hanjin that's uh, mm-hmm. filing for bankruptcy. I mean, that's huge, and that's going to the, the effects of that are going to flow on. That's a massive company, and that could bankrupt all sorts of other people on the way. And then you've got China um, going to be introduced into the SDR basket at the end of this month, and we heard. Jacob Rothschild, you know, the Rothschild family sort of at the very core of the whole banking system. They set the system up and he was saying how they're, you know, moving away from the US dollar and putting um, more into gold. And then George Soros, who I can't stand, but you look at what (laughs) he's doing. He's taken, you know, 37% and liquidated his stocks and put that into gold and precious metals. And it all adds up to, hang on, something big is going on under the surface here. And it could be us something suddenly that does hit. In fact, we're in a far worse situation than it was this time last year when everyone was expecting that it was going to happen. And yet people have gone back to sleep, like you say. And what about the church in America overall? Where Where is the church at? Well, it's the same scenario. I mean, the church and the world, you can't tell them apart hardly anymore. You know, you can't tell the difference between a nightclub and a, and a church for the most part. So it's in the same condition. It's the same boat, Brother Tony. People are just going back to sleep. They're in this mentality that I'm out of here. I'm going to be raptured out of here. I'm not going to have any pain, no sorrow. Uh, You know, we're going to be fine. It just can't happen here in America. And it can't happen to the church. And the truth of the matter is it is happening. It's happening right before us. You know, somebody asked me one time, when's the economy going to crash? I said, it already has. We're just watching it in real time. We just we just haven't been been told yet as a people, but it's already happened. And and like you mentioned, your your analogy and your um, your evidence is absolutely online. And we can pile more information on there to the reality of the economy. But um this is what I, I want to tell people, Brother Tony, is I don't want them to focus necessarily on, on the economy. I want them to focus on their relationship with God and get ready for the storm, get ready for the death angel, if you will, the crossover, and for them to have the blood of Jesus applied to their lives and get prepared spiritually because there's coming more. The economic crash is going to be the least of your concern. It's the effects of it. It's what happens before. It ha- what happens during. What happens when this election is hijacked, and all these things. You know what you have in your bank and in your wallet 
and in your possession is the least of your concerns. And that's the way the Father's showing me, Brother Tony. Yes, uh, yeah, the whole thing. I can't see with the elections. I, I really can't see how you get away without rioting, and no matter who wins uh, that one. If it's Trump, then the, you will have the left funded largely by George Soros, etc. They'll cause rioting. You'll have if if Clinton's elected, you'll have the Trump side going. We've had enough, you know. And there, I can see rioting. Obama staying in power because there's martial law, whatever. I can't see a good result coming out of it. But get, just changing tack a little bit, you also shared a word on Z3 News titled, The Time Has Come to Reveal the Sins of My Bride. In it, you said the following, Come out of the Babylonian churches, flee from the stench of rebellion. What do you see as the outworking of this, and where are the true believers going to go, and what should they do? Well, I think the first thing they should do is prayerfully consider to get out of these churches, and and once you make that decision to go, uh, then I'm fully uh, supportive of house churches. I think house churches are going to be uh, the next great thing, if you will, the next great movement of God. It's going to be people to people, person to person, neighbor to neighbor, community to community. Uh, the Lord showed me years ago that we are going to to get away from this centralized religion, religion in America, the centralized denominational model. And we're going to go back to grassroots. We're going to go back to communities like it used to be. And the reason for that is the chaos in our nation. In other words, you're not going to be flying off to headquarters. You're not going to be having relationships with uh, your headquarters where you're, you know, the denomination or whatever it is. It, it, and so it's going to be this revival centers, these these houses of fire and power uh, that I see are going to be raised up before we go underground. You know, there's going to be stages. And so that's what I've been encouraging people to do. Get out of those Babylonian churches, huddle with your family, start prayer groups, cell groups, you know, uh, start seeking the Father's face, pray, and then just let God develop whatever he's going to develop. Some people will go to a type of brick-and-mortar situation and start a work for however long that lasts. I don't know. Uh, but to get out, that would be my first uh, response to somebody asking that question. Yeah, get out of them churches. Yes. Uh, I, mean, I see there's a you know an increasing move well, Pope Francis actually, you know, uniting the churches or there's all these kind of gatherings of all denominations and um, and he's behind a lot of it. And I think that this is not good. It's not, it's not the true gospel that we're being presented, but there's a lot of these churches are following on with it and thinking that, uh, you know, we're going to have peace and security when Jesus didn't actually say that said, I've come to bring a sword and division, you know. <laughs> and yet right. they're going for this uniting of religions and not just in Christianity, but in general. Yeah, it's ecumenical garbage is what it is. It's the whore church. It's the super church. It's the, it's the mega end time Babylonian church, the, you know, the whole uh, antichrist system. And so I wouldn't have anything to do with it. If you you know, if your denomination or organization, and by the way, I'm not anti-denominational. What I am uh, against is is anything that is uh, uh, that suppresses the movement of God, that suppresses the reality of, of true theology, the true word of God. And again, false ecumenical partnerships. I have a great problem with that. Uh, but yeah, that church is, here's the thing, the wheat and the tares are growing together. And this is what the remnant have to understand. This is what people who are listening right now that are struggling with being in a denominational church or the church that grandpa built or whatever, and you're struggling. What you're doing is you're wheat and you're among tares right now. And this whole system is going to grow together. But you have to make a decision. Am I going to be a part of this tear system, this Babylonian system, or am I going to go on with God and see what he's going to do in these last days? What does it entail? What is, you know, repentance, I think, is an important part that's missing. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean for the average person? Where are we going? You know, what, where are we all going wrong? Well, we don't understand what repentance is because we don't understand what conviction is. Conviction is has been 
taught today, uh, really, it's a form of condemnation. They say to you, well, you know, don't condemn me. You can't talk down to me. Don't, you know, you're hurting my feelings and all of this, yeah. this, uh, you know, seeker friendly type of attitude. When the reality is true repentance is having your heart broken before God. Break uh, Sin is not breaking God's law. Sin is breaking God's heart. And when you understand that, then true repentance comes because you realize you offended the Father. You offended the, the Holy Spirit. You offended the Word of God. You offended Jesus. And when you realize that, Brother Tony, uh, you know, you, you just have a, a real down-to-heart moment where you say, Father, forgive me. I, I sinned. I'm wrong. And then you you list those sins. And this sounds so, so uh you know, so basic, Brother Tony, but I'm telling you, a lot of people in the church don't understand repentance because they're told to come down to the altar by by some psychologist, come on, in a suit, yeah. and, and just try to talk to their conscience and talk to the solical man and maybe get some tears and then get a confession and then it's over. True repentance, man, you're bawling before God. You are weeping. You're crying out. You are so sorry for your sin because you broke the heart of God. You've offended him. And the reason we don't have true repentance is not only because we're not preaching a convicting gospel. We have lost the fear of the Lord. We have lost the fear of who the Father really is. And I teach this a lot because uh, what we've what we've come to, Brother Tony, is we want a Jesus only. We want a New Testament Jesus. And Jesus said, I came to show you the Father. Well, how do you find the Father? You find him through the law of, of first mention. You have to go back to the beginning and then, then navigate through the Word of God, through the Old Testament, and you see the Father. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Carry on. This is sounding great. And so when you do that, then you begin to understand the nature of daddy, the nature of Abba, the nature of Father God. Then then you have a genuine uh, conversion in your heart. Now you understand I'm not just saved by grace and, and, and kept from going to a devil's hell. I have a daddy God who loves me. I have a father who my sins offend. And I think it's it's a beautiful analogy, but we've lost the fear of the Lord. We don't have that anymore in our churches. We're preaching compromise. We have pastors that want to be your best friend. I don't want to be anybody's best friend, not when it comes to compromising. I love my congregation. I have great friends all around, but I'm not going to compromise the gospel for your tithe, for your offering, or for your acceptance of me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah I mean, yes. And, and where is the kind of, you know, the weeping preaching uh, these days? You know, the, the, the ones whose hearts are really rent and are, going, you know, rescuing the congregation. It seems to be that by and large, it's just pep talks and new age PC that's coming from pulpits. Well, exactly, because we have faulty conversions because we preach a faulty gospel. We have faulty cemeteries, oh, excuse me, seminaries, <laughs> uh, where dead men are being taught dead theology by, you know, these, these demons that are, that are teaching them. And, and so we're producing basically psychologists to try to deal with the carnality of man. And the only way to deal with sin and the flesh is to declare the person a sinner. You are a sinner. You have sinned. You have fallen short of the glory of God. And only the righteous blood of Jesus can bring you back to a relationship with God. But we don't teach that anymore. We don't show men their sins. And the reason we don't is because we have no conviction in the pulpit. These men, not all, but these men, most of them, they have no real conviction about God in their own privacy of their lives. You know, we're... Where are the Jonathan Edwards? Yeah. Where are the Charles Finneys, the Reese House? Where are these great men and women of God? Where are they today? The mantles are there. 
Brother Tony, the mantles of that. But who's willing, listening to me right now, who's willing to grab hold of the mantles of these great men and women of God and preach like you've never preached before, showing men their sin? Yeah, well, it's becoming increasingly difficult, I suppose. Uh, calling sin, sin, you know, you're, you're, you're there, you become on some sort of government list even now if you start doing that, you know. You can't even teach Jesus as the only way because that offends the uh, Muslim uh, that's the president at the moment um, who seems yeah. to, you know, and, and I can see that becoming more and more. And so this false ecumenical movement where they're uniting all the churches and not only the churches but all other religions, it's going to be, well, it's going to be increasingly difficult to actually call Jesus as the only way without coming into real, you know, real uh, oppression and danger. But that shouldn't stop us. No, not at all. Let, let's uh, let's rewrite the book, you know, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Let's add a modern chapter to it. You see, we have to come to that place, Brother Tony, that we're so in fire, so on fire, so full of passion for Jesus Christ. Death doesn't matter. Life doesn't matter. The pursuit of self doesn't matter. It's all about Jesus. And I believe he is raising up a fiery brand of preachers. And I'm not the only one. There, there are, are, are multitudes. There's a plethora. And I've said this and prophesied this in the past. They're coming. They're coming from the mountains, the woodworks, the places that nobody knows about, Brother Tony. They are coming in the spirit of Elijah. They're coming in the power of the Holy Ghost. And they don't care what men say. They're not trying to hurt. They're not trying to be brash. It's just the nature, and it's the nature of the hour. Look at John the Baptist. Look at him. Look how he came and how he ministered, how foreign he was to the uh, Sadduceeical and Pharisaical religious society of his hour and was one, and considered one of the greatest. You know, we're going to have to come to the point where it doesn't matter. I'm talking to ministers right now, preachers, chaplains. I don't care if you carry a Bible and preach this blessed truth. You're going to have to stop worrying about your career you have to stop worrying about your organization and what they think. You have to stop worrying about your denomination, whether they're going to cut you off. Let them cut you off. It's greater, and it's a greater reward to serve Jesus in truth and preach holiness than it is to compromise and bend a knee to man. Yeah, that's that's so true. I mean, I mean even as individuals, I, I you know, I find I notice hardness in my own heart and areas, and I'm thinking, oh God, this so needs to deal with, you know, um, change me uh, the, from the inside out. But how many people are really doing that, or how many people are just going, oh no, no, we don't want to change? Well, that's a, that's a great question, and that's why judgment's coming. That's why God's going to change the guard. That's why God's going to strip. That's why God is going to release and remove. He's going to dismantle this current church system, this wineskin that we're in. He's going to allow judgment, terrorism, economic collapse, chaos, crisis, all the things we don't want. He's going to allow to take place because that is the answer because we failed to do it the grace way. We failed to do it the free way, which was the fall on our face now and seek him and say, God, we repent of our sins. So God says, you know what? I'm going to have to deal with you. I'm going to deal with you like I dealt with ancient Israel. But when you come out of this, oh, the glory, the manifestation, the power of God that will be on us. But we've reached the point of no return, Brother Tony, and we have to go through the fire of persecution and the fire of judgment in order to be refined. Yeah, it's not a pleasant thought, though. That's you know, it's bracing ourselves for what's coming, um, and then having to trust that God's going to give us the strength to get through it as individuals, um, because it's well, certainly looking pretty like a massive storm on the horizon. Well, that, we, that goes right back to what we talked about, brother Tony. Faith. Yeah. He's trying to get us back to the center, back to the core, and that's a personal relationship with Him. And it's 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 you know, it's a sad thing. Nobody likes to preach these things. It doesn't make me popular. I, I could care less about popularity. I pray you never know my name. Just know who who, you know, Jesus is and, and where to find the church. That, that's all that matters to me.
But the reality is what we've done has not worked. What we've tried, the bargaining and the bribery with God, it's over. It is over. It is now the day of reckoning. It's now the time for the seriousness of the harvest because so many people are departing from this earth without Christ. Even as you and I speak right now, there's an act of terrorism somewhere in the world. There's a murder being taken place. Somebody's departing without hearing Jesus' uh, you know, his offer of salvation. And so God is going to raise up the church in this hour to do a great work. And it's not going to be in our polished palaces it's going to be in the place of, of persecution and pain. So yeah, there has to be a um, there has to be a hope, doesn't it? Because uh, you know we can sort of hear doom and gloom. You know, all's going to be doom and gloom. But nobody really thrives on hopelessness and feeling like we're just waiting for the axe to fall. So there mm-hmm. must be an upside. You know, God is do- allowing us to go through it f- for a reason, and and it can't be you know, to destroy us. <laughs> no, no, he, he's not a child abuser. He, he's, he's a wonderful father. He's a faithful friend. He's a friend that sticks closer than any brother. Uh, he'll never leave us, never forsake us. And so that is the, the hope that we have. But the hope that we have is to come out of this refined. Nobody wants to go through the fuller soap. Nobody wants to go through the refiner's fire. But you have to. You have to go through the garden before you get to the resurrection. You have to go to the cross before you get to the resurrection. So there's so many steps that we as a church must take before glory comes. And uh, unfortunately, God had a plan for us to walk in this power, but we continue to reject it. We rejected it by promoting these these polished preachers who tell us that, uh, you know, there's many ways to Christ. And you know what's happened with all this this craziness out there. And we've lost the fire. We don't have fire for Christ anymore. No, that's that's kind of scary. What else has God been showing you? Well, you know, he, he's been showing me that it's, it's just time to prepare. It's time to get ready for the great harvest that's coming. That's the upside. That's the hope, the faith side, the good news, that a tremendous harvest is coming while the The earth is going through slaughter while the earth is going through judgment and great change. uh, It is going to be the greatest time in recorded history of humanity. The greatest harvest is going to be upon us. And we are going to see the blinded eyes open, the deaf ears unstopped, the lame are going to walk, the dead are going to rise. We're going to see wayward children come back home. Children are going to prophesy on the street corners. and, And we're going to see a massive movement towards God again. So, you know, he's been sharing with me that we need to prepare for that. And and the greatest way to prepare and really the only way to prepare is to make our hearts clean again, to come before the Father in intimacy and say, God, the reason there's no revival is not because of the sinner down the road. The reason is because of me. I'm the one that's unclean. I'm the one that's undone. And, And I think, Brother Tony, as we become transparent with God, then God will become transparent with us and he'll begin to pour his spirit upon a clean vessel. And that's my hope. And that's my message. It's not just the terror, not just the judgment, but what's coming through to the other side. What we're going to receive as our reward is going to be beyond our imaginations. Yes, it's it's very easy to be so focused on this life and this earth that we can forget what the whole purpose is and what is on the other side. Um, I'm I'm just thinking, you know, the thoughts of revival. Have we ever really seen a real revival in in our lifetimes? Or is what's coming going to look nothing like what we've seen? Yeah, I, I, you know, there's been great move, moves of God. In any move of God, you always have an element of flesh. You can go through history and look at different healing revivals and so on and so forth. And there's always an element of flesh because God has to work with flesh. Unfortunately, he works with you and I. Yeah. And so there's shortcomings. But what I see coming is a, is a totality. It's a combination of everything 
that we've ever seen on the planet. This is the way the Lord showed it to me one day. He showed me there's going to be an Acts chapter 2, part 2. See, it wasn't finished. And there's a lot to get into that with Joel and then with what Peter said about uh, about that day of Pentecost. But it wasn't finished. The greatest outpouring is going to be the former and the latter rain, just one tremendous flood of the glory of God, where, you know, the sons of God, the daughters of God, uh, the, the Greek word is, is the weosses of God, the mature. And when we come to maturity, remember, Jesus is trying to get us to, to that maturity. When we come to that maturity and we can handle the inheritance, not just heaven someday inheritance, but the inheritance of the outpouring of the spirit. When this generation proves that we're ready to walk in that glory, that glory is coming. And I'm going to tell you something. We ain't never seen anything that's coming off the sapphire seals of heaven's gates. We ain't seen nothing that's going to be poured out of the portals of God's throne room. We are going to be saturated in that glory. And uh, I can feel it right now. And, and we are going to experience things like we've never, never seen in human history. And, and so, yeah, we've, had, we've seen some things. We've seen a, a glimpse into the future. But what's really coming, I believe no man has ever totally experienced it. Yeah, well, that's that's exciting. I mean, that's what I mean. That's the upside to all of this. And I think I'm not the only one. I'm sure lots of other people look back at ministries of people like Smith Wigglesworth and mm-hmm. and marvel over what that man did. There was just one man with faith, you know, that did so many incredible miracles. And then we don't see so much of it, not in our Western society now anyway. And, and that was just one man. So a whole movement of Christians right. with that sort of power would literally turn the word world upside down the way they did in the book of Acts. Exactly. And that's what he's looking for. He's looking for the camp. He's looking for the community. He's looking for the army, the bride, the church. He's looking for us to come together corporately, not through denominations, not through contacts. This is all going to be being done by the Holy Spirit. In fact, I believe there's going to come a time you know, you're not even going to know what they're doing on the other side of the coast, but you just know God is moving in and among his church in a tremendous, mighty way. Listen, the prophets, the angels, they all desire to look into our day. This is this is the wrap up. And this is what I try to teach, teach my people and anybody that will listen. This is the wrap up, the final harvest of God. Do you think he's going to hold back a little You think he's going to, you know, well, I decided I'm going to hold my anointing for another day. No, he's going to pour out all that he has. He said the spirit will be upon all flesh, all flesh. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and and necessarily walk around with the glory. What that means is that when you and I and the body of Christ goes out into the workplace and into the main street, into life itself, they're going to see the glory of Jesus Christ on us everybody's going to experience the glory in some way, in some form, in some fashion. It's it's up to them, though, whether they jump into the river or not. But we're going to have plenty of anointing. So many of us probably long for a closer relationship with God, you know, with, um, with our Lord, you know, and to know him more and understand him more and to have that just sense of, of the closeness and... I would imagine that the the, um, the apostles, um, the disciples in the book of Acts, who actually had walked with Jesus, they would have had that remembrance of knowing what he was when he walked the earth as a man. But at the same time, the the knowing of him then must have been so much more in the book of Acts than even when he was walking on the earth. And I, I kind of I long for the, you know, to know my mm-hmm. Savior like that. Yeah. Well, it's available. It's available for all of us. And I think the key is not necessarily doing more. I think the key is being consistent. You know, you and I have both have gone through this. We get into this, this momentum of wanting to change and get more of the Lord. And we start these spiritual calisthenics and exercises. And, you know, after a little while, we fall off yeah. the boat, if you will. Yeah. Yep. 
you know, and uh, I remember, I'll tell you this quick story. Uh, you know, I have a spiritual, some spiritual DNA of, of Smith Wigglesworth through Dr. Lester Summer, who laid hands on me and Pastor Rod Parsley. And that, yeah. that was my whole spiritual upbringing. And so uh, I love uh, Smith Wigglesworth and all the stories. Well, I heard a story one time that he used to get up every morning, jump out of bed and dance for 15 minutes and praise God. I tried that for like two days. <laughs> You ever done something like, and you know what? It didn't work for me. Yeah. Uh, so as a trial and error, I've recognized and realized over these years that if I'll just be consistent with the father, never miss a date with him, never miss a moment with him, be constantly mindful of him and constantly in communication with him, I'm, I'm growing more than I really realize. And Smith Wigglesworth, he said this, he said, I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. And so that's the truth. So consistency, consistency, I think, uh, Brother Tony, is the key. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's right. Um, I admire um, people that do, you know, that are consistent over a long period of time with their prayer lives and things. And I look at myself and, you know, you start off with a hiss and a roar and then it <laughs> fades away and, and you know, and then it's like, you whoa, wait. slap yourself around the ears again and get back to it. But I go through this repeatedly, you know. Yeah. The consistency yeah. is, yeah, that's the hard part. But so yeah. going back to the 60 days again, we're, we're into that into that now um, again. What, what, what do you suggest people that actually do now that we're this close? Well, again, you know, you take it first to the Father, you know, if you believe it's a word from him, then you should act accordingly in faith and, and just pray and say, Father, what do you want me to do in this hour? I believe it's a prophetic word. Um, and, you know, soon after I gave this word, there's many other prophetic voices that have come up with the same uh, type of word uh, time frames. I was very uh, pleased to see that also in the intellectual realm, you know, experts, uh, everybody's talking this. So I believe it is of the Lord. So again, the first thing for me is, is your relationship with God to just get your house in order, get your spiritual life together. If you've got secret sins, they're not a secret to God. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Repent of them. Ask the Father to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to rid these things uh, in your life. And then, you know, Brother Tony, it's, it's to prepare yourself as you would a storm. What do you do? You know, if you know a storm is bearing down on your community, you prepare accordingly. You, you know, you, you, you get the necessities. And again, I don't want to try to fill people's minds with that. There's so many resources, resources out there that are way beyond me. Uh, but that's what I'm doing for, for, for my house is, is preparing. And what would you say to those people that are struggling with fear? Because, you know, when we hear these kind of words, to some people it just engenders fear and then they try to either bury their heads in the sand or they run around like headless chickens trying to do everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're right. And I deal with that too with, with people who email me and contact me. I'm, I, you know, I've, 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 I've blown a lot of people away by personally talking to them on the phone. They, they can't believe that a pastor would actually talk to them on the phone, but I will, and I have. I've ministered to a lot of people that never met me, and I try to calm those fears because, you know, I, I feel for people. I, um, my past profession, I was a firefighter, uh, EMT, so I dealt with trauma. I dealt with crisis and chaos, and I understand the loss of life and the loss of possessions. And so um, when I preach this message, I'm not trying to come from a brash, shock and all, get as much attention as I possibly can. I'm preaching this from the heart of God, and this is the way it comes out. So to those who are fearful, I always try to give them faith and hope and add in the love of God to this. And to you that are listening to me, you know, being fearful and hiding doesn't make these things go away. There has to be an end game someday. There has to be a folding up of the whole plans of humanity. And we happen to be the, that generation. So we have to face that. So number one, you have to face the facts and reality. This is the hour we're in. But you also have to embrace the reality that the Father loves you more than anything you could ever imagine. It's unmeasurable. It's beyond the mind of man how deep his love is. I don't have enough words to articulate 
how much he loves me. All I can do is look at the cross and say, there it is. And you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to have hope in your relationship with God that there is a resurrection someday. You have to have reality and, and faith in reality of the word that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that he'll never leave you and never forsake you. And, and you have to ask the Holy Spirit to give you boldness in this hour. He understands you. He understands your fear. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'll never look down on anybody who's, who has concern or anxiety and fear in this hour. I, I won't. Because I'll tell you, that's natural. We all should have some fear. We all should have some, uh, uh, you know, holy reverence about, about what is going to come down on this earth. But it's not a paralyzing fear. It's a realization that our God is still God and he'll do what he needs to do. And uh, that that's what I would say, Brother Tony. I, I feel very, very... Uh, compassion, a lot of compassion in my heart for people who are fearful. But you have to stand in faith with God. He loves you. So can you can you um, give us your website and where they can find you, where your church is, and then maybe you could close out by actually praying for those people which have fear, if you wouldn't mind? Oh, that would be a great honor. Well, you can go to our website. It, it's Ignited Life. Uh, excuse me, ignitedchurchlife.com, ignitedchurchlife.com. And we're located at 580 East Main Street in Livonia, Georgia. And so you can get all that information on ignitedchurchlife.com. And uh, you can also follow me on Facebook. That's Benjamin Faircloth. And uh, we'd love to fellowship with you. Just send me a, a message. And we pray for everybody. Brother Tony, this is not a marketing uh, mantra. We pray for every person that contacts this ministry, we have a, a, a cross that we built that the Father instructed me to build, and we put names on that cross in our sanctuary, and our church lays hands on that cross weekly. And so anybody that's tied into this ministry, extended uh, family, we pray for you, and I just want you to know that. Awesome. Heavenly Father, we come before your awesome throne today just thanking you for your great grace and your marvelous mercy. I want to thank you, Father, that you're the same. You're the same God. You've never changed. You're still the same God who breathed life into Adam. You're still the same God that walked with the children of Israel on their journey away from Pharaoh. You're the same God that took Israel through all their wanderings and all of their hard times as a nation that was rebellious. You are the same through Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And I thank you that you will never, ever change, that your word is truth, O oh Lord. And I pray for my brothers and sisters tonight that they, wherever they may be, it may be morning time, whatever hour it is, you are the same. And I ask for you to embrace them with your wonderful love. Would you speak to them, Father, in their dreams? Would you give them visions? Would you whisper in their ears how much you love them? Would you bring them, Holy Ghost men and women, to partner with them and connect with them in a faithful community of believers? God, I pray today that fear would leave their heart right now, that anxiety and panic and worry would leave them right now, that sleeplessness would be churned into beautiful rest for your beloved Father, this is a hard word. Father, these are hard days, but you are faithful nonetheless. And so I pray, God, in this hour of temptation, in this hour of trial, though the cup may not pass from us, I pray, Father, that you would give us the strength, you would give us the tenacity, you would give us the faith, and most of all, you would give us the love to be able to endure these days. And I thank you for that. Bless my brothers and my sisters listening now and let the angels of God surround about them and their loved ones. In Jesus' mighty awesome name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Benjamin. That was awesome. Thank you for being on and we'll definitely be wanting to have you back again before long. I'm sure our listeners will want that. Thank you, Brother Tony. Again, I'm extremely humbled. I bless you, my brother. Well, there's some powerful words in there, plenty to think about. I encourage you to visit a minute to midnight.com where we post all our shows and also we have well written articles regularly posted there. 
We have an A Minute to Midnight Facebook group if you wish to join that and contribute, that would be great. I write and record all the music for our shows and you'll find a link to my music at rockshawsounds.com and that is found from our A Minute to Midnight website, a link is there. We have a donation button on our website and we really greatly appreciate it when people donate because we only keep this running because of your donations so thank you to those that do help us out there. Well that's it for the show today, this is Tony signing off, until next time.